This is the SAP 6502, which is a TTL CPU that executes 6502 machine code directly. Here it is playing Apple II Pac-Man, but I haven't optimized it for speed yet. The design for this machine is outlined in this playlist, which is almost complete. There's just one outstanding episode on binary coded decimal mode yet to be done. Its design is based on Albert Paul Malvino's SAP-1, or Simple as Possible 1 computer, which was upgraded and popularized by Ben Eater on YouTube. The idea is to keep the same overall architecture as the SAP-1, but to bulk it up enough to run 6502 machine code. This is the final architecture, and it maintains the single central 8-bit W bus. When you decide to build your own TTL CPU, there are a number of decisions to make. Should I use a 1-bit, 4-bit, 8-bit, 16-bit or 32-bit bus? Other bus sizes are possible, but these seem to be the most common ones. The next decision is to use a classic von Neumann architecture versus a Harvard architecture, or to use a RAM machine which is close to Alan Turing's original definition. Another big decision is whether to come up with a new instruction set or use an existing instruction set. Now for me personally, I know I'm never going to get around to writing a full toolchain for a new instruction set, so I tend to go with an existing one. But which one should I use? If I want to build an 8-bit machine, then most of the existing software is either 6502 based or Z80 based, and in this series I'm going to stick with the 6502. The downside of using an existing instruction set is that you really need to implement it in its entirety. For the 6502, we need to implement all 13 addressing modes, which is a challenge. I've started the process of building the microcode in this playlist. The microcode generator is available on GitHub, and the first video in the series tells you how to download it and run it. In the last video, I looked at zero page, zero page X indexed, zero page Y indexed and absolute addressing modes. And in this video, I'm gonna go over absolute X indexed, absolute Y indexed, and the much tougher X indexed indirect and indirect Y indexed addressing modes. Even if you determine to roll your own instruction set, I would still strongly suggest you work your way through this video. Just to get an idea of the scope of the work and to help you make a better decision about using a new versus an existing instruction set. Now I'm going to write the microcode for the remaining addressing modes. While I'm at it, I'm going to update the ADC command within the emulator to store the carry bit into the P flag, which is bit 9 of the sum. Now hopefully you'll remember this P flag is a new one I've added, and it's the page boundary flag. It's always updated on every ALU operation. Any guesses as to why I'm doing it now? I want to implement the absolute X and absolute Y addressing modes, so let's walk through an example of absolute X to make sure we know what it's doing. The absolute index addressing mode actually starts out the same as absolute addressing. Instructions that use this addressing mode are three bytes long, where the first byte is the opcode, and then that's followed by two bytes of address. The address gets loaded into the effective address registers like in absolute mode, but then we add the value in either index X or index Y to the effective address register pair. This is an 8-bit unsigned addition to a 16-bit unsigned number with carry. We don't need to sign extend the 8-bit hexadecimal value we want to add, so XX becomes a 16-bit value 00XX. Let's walk through an example of absolute X addressing with the store A instruction. Its opcode is 9D hexadecimal, and here we can see one stored at 6E8D. After we interpret the instruction, the first thing we want to do is transfer the 0 at 6E8E into our EAL register, and then transfer the 90 at 6EAF into our EAH register. This gives us a base address of 0, 0,900 hexadecimal, and now we want to offset this by the value in index x. We make index x a 16-bit value with the upper 8 bits being set to 0, and then we add this to our EAL and EAH registers. The results are stored in EAL and EAH, 
And now we take the value in our A register, which is zero, and store it at the location pointed to by our effective address registers. The final address is 901 in this case. If you'll recall, I used the code for zero page as the template for absolute addressing, where I just did another main memory read and put the value into EAH. Now, I want to use zero page X as the template for absolute X, but it's slightly more complicated. If there's a carry out from this first addition, then I need to add one to the value stored in EAH. To do this, first I instruct the flag selection bits to use the P flag. In the real hardware, this will direct the 74HC151 multiplexer to select the P flag as the input to A16. From the microcodes perspective, I use this flag to decide whether to add 0 or add 1 to the value I want to put in EAH. I load either 0 or 1 into the B register depending on the status of the P flag. If P is clear, then I load 0 into the B register. But if P is set, then I'll load 1 into B reg. This is the first time where the two different copies of the microcode in the EEPROM will have different values. One value for when A16 is clear, and the other for when A16 is set. I need to add this line of code to the emulator so it calculates the correct address for the next micro instruction. It uses flag select to decide which bit of the ST reg it reads. If that bit is set, we assert A16 before we read the microcode. If it's clear, then we just use the lower copy of the microcode. If you're not clear about this, it may be worth pausing at this stage to stop and think about it for a moment. Next, we do a main memory read into the accumulator hold register. We increment the program counter after we've done this. Now, we're ready to do another ALU addition, but this time we want to put the results into EAH, and we don't need the P flag anymore after that. About half the time, this second addition will be unnecessary. I'll just be adding zero. That seems to happily compile and run. Oh crap. I wasn't actually generating microcode for this instruction. Let me fix that. I'll clean up the code a little. I'll copy the absolute X microcode into absolute Y. All I need to do is change the value from X reg to Y reg. Let's try this. Excellent! I want to talk about X indexed indirect addressing mode. Instructions that use this addressing mode are two bytes long, the first byte being the opcode, and this is followed by a zero page address. The idea is that we add index X to this zero page address. This forms a new zero page address, and then we do indirect addressing based on this new zero page address. We read from the zero page address and store the value in EAL. Then we read from the next address and store that value in EAH. Let's walk through an example diagrammatically. Here we can see the opcode 81 with the address 12. We add this to the 24 stored in the index X register, and we store the result, which is 36, in EAL. We then use this EAL to point to the zero page again. And we want the 1 0 at 36 to be stored in EAL and the 3 0 at 37 to be stored in EAH. We then write the value in the accumulator into the main memory address pointed to by EAL and EAH, which is 3010 hexadecimal. I'm going to use the absolute X microcode for X indexed indirect addressing. The first four lines of microcode are basically the same as zero page X addressing. So let's compare these first four micro instructions with the microcode for zero page X addressing. They're identical. This time, however, we do a main memory read, which we move into the EBL register. We're basically using this as temporary storage. This holds the least significant byte of the address we want to pass onto the instruction. Now we want to increment the EAL register. So we copy it over to the A hold register, we move the constant 1 into the B register, 
Then we do an ALU add and store the result in the EAL register. The EA registers now store our zero page address plus one. It's important to note that if our zero page address was FF, it'll wrap around to address zero rather than going to address 100. Now here's the tricky bit. The effective address registers hold the address of the most significant byte that we want to pass onto our instruction. So now we do a main memory read from the address in the EA registers and store the value in EAH. Now this is quite tricky. The EAH register is used both as the source address and the destination. We can do this because EAH is stable while we're doing the main memory read. This puts the value onto the W bus, then we latch this value into EAH at the very end of the instruction, on the rising edge of clock. The last micro instruction in the sequence just copies the value in EBL into EAL. At the end of all of this, EAL and EAH should now contain our effective address. Unfortunately, Pac-Man doesn't really use this addressing mode with STA, so we'll have to try and test it later. Now let's look at indirect Y indexed addressing mode. This is a two byte instruction, and the way it works is that the zero page address and zero page plus one point to the base address. This base address is 16 bits, then we do an unsigned 8-bit addition with the index Y register with carry. This base address plus Y is our effective address, which is then used by the instruction execution phase. This mode is extensively used by the Pac-Man code, particularly for writing pixels to the screen. Let's walk through an example. Here, the address 6985 contains the opcode 91, which is STA using indirect Y indexed mode. Here, the zero page address is 12, so we look up 12, and we store the contents, which is A8, in our EAL register. We then go to the next address, which is 13, and store that value in our EAH register. Now we have a 16-bit address stored in our EAL and EAH registers. Then we add the 8-bit index Y register with carry. The result is stored in our EAL and EAH register. This is our effective address, 39A8 in this case. Then we write the value of 80 stored in the accumulator to this address. I'm going to use X indexed indirect as a template, so I'll just copy and paste it. I do a zero page memory read using the operand as the address, and we store the result in EBL. You can see here that the first two lines of microcode are the same as the zero page microcode. Next, we increment EAL by one using the ALU. We perform a main memory read and we load the result into EAH. Now what we want to do is add the value in EBL to the Y register and store the result in EAL. This is our Y indexing. If the addition results in a carry, then we need to increment EAH, just like we did in the absolute X addressing where we used the P flag. If the P flag is clear, I just do a bunch of no ops, but if it's set, I'll move the EAH into the B register. I load a constant value of 1 into the A hold register. And then I do an ALU add and store the result in EAH. Just to go over that again quickly. If the original addition has no carry, then I just execute three no ops. But if carry was set, then I add one to EAH. In retrospect, I probably wouldn't have done it this way, but I'll stick with this for now. I need to add the STA instruction using these addressing modes into the control program ROM. Remember that each opcode has a case clause within this switch statement. I need to add them to SAP 6502 cycles so that this code actually gets executed. Let's compile it and see if I can keep up my batting average. Oh well, there goes the neighborhood.
Let's have a look at the code. I'll stop it at the indirect Y indexed STA instruction, which is opcode 91. Still not working. Here's a problem. I forgot to add the zero flag to this function call. I'll just fix that quickly, but I'm not sure that this is the problem. It'll just add unwanted no ops, so that shouldn't cause an issue. I'll comment out the 91 op code so it uses Apple Win for this instruction. Let's have a look. Yep, that's working. So indirect Y indexed is the problem. Let me pay Pac-Man for a while while I think about this. I'll try to isolate out the 91 op code to make sure this is actually causing the problem. Compile and run. Hmm, no joy. To try and solve this, I think I'm going to have to go nuclear. I'm just going to comment out the emulator and write the code that does the instruction directly in C. Increment the program counter to get past the opcode. Load the operand as the zero page address. If the zero page address is FF, then use memory offsets FF and 00, zero to form the base address. Otherwise, just use zero page and zero page plus one. We add Y to the base address and use Apple Win to do the main memory write of the A register. As an aside, this write macro uses the ADDR value as the address. Increment the program counter to get past the operand. I'll give this a try. Okay, this means the instruction works the way I think it does. I just haven't encoded it properly. I'm going to have to go back and try to figure out where. I want to compare the effective address the microcode generates against the effective address the C code generates, and also check the program counter while I'm at it. Now this line, int error equals one, might be a bit unusual, but it lets me generate a breakpoint and I can inspect all of the variables. Let's compile this and add some breakpoints. All right, we've hit an error condition. The microcode is generating an effective address of zero, while the C code generates an effective address of 400. Let's check the program counter. That looks good. I'm just gonna step through the code and see if I can figure out what's going on. I'll snoop on the step counter. Step through the micro instructions. I'm out at step 4, and we have 0028 in our effective address registers. Now, the next couple of microcode instructions should increment EAL by 1. Let's go out a bit further to step 8, and we should see 0029 as our effective address. But look, it's still showing 0028. Let's look at the code in this do while loop. It turns out I haven't implemented the constant register in my emulator. I'm not quite sure why absolute x and absolute y didn't pick this up. Maybe they just didn't exercise the corner case where constant is anything but zero. It does highlight the need for a little more diversity in my testing suite though. That's looking pretty good. I'll just clean it up a little and get rid of this C code. And there we have it. Apple II Pac-Man up and running. This is likely to be the hardest video in the whole series. So I would encourage you to go and download the Apple Win emulator and the microcode generator from GitHub and step through the code yourself at your own pace. Maybe watch this video again after you've done that. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and in the next video I'll start going over more instructions.